We are here at the New York Grand Prix and we have Coach Pompey. She's one of the greatest athletes to come out of Guyana. Um, and she's been integral in like New York City track and field in pl uh, a plethora of different ways. Um, so thank you for joining us and just let us know how you're feeling about um, the meet today. I thought it was a great meet. Um, it's always powerful when athletes of this caliber come to New York City. I think it's motivating um, for the city and you know there's a lot of schools here. You have a lot of track fans, a lot of Jamaicans, a lot of Caribbean people. So you always get a really good crowd um, which I think motivates the athletes. So all around I think it was a win. Yeah, absolutely. And so you had an amazing career on the track, and I think a lot of people look to you in terms of, you know, Guyanese um, track and field and the history of it. Um, so talk to me about kind of some of your greatest moments or some of the things that you look back on in terms of your career. Um, I think you're too kind, but I'll take it. Um, there, there's a lot that I look back on, you know, it depends on what I'm trying to get out of it. Um, but right now I'm kind of focused on making sure that the Guyanese athletes, especially at the national and international level, have a platform, have a means of um, competing at the very highest level. And so, you know, one of the things that I did to kind of facilitate that was founding the API, which is an annual meet in Guyana. Unfortunately, it was supposed to be held next weekend, but it's canceled for a couple of reasons. But um, there's a lot of plans to get it going for next year, a lot more supporters. So I think we're on top for that. Got it, got it. Um, and then talk to me about your transition from uh, from college, right, from competing in college and then going professional and competing internationally. What was that transition like? And not even necessarily like track stuff, but even just becoming an adult, right, and growing up and <laughs> being a professional. Yeah, I really thought that being in college made me an adult until I did transition to running professionally and then I clearly wasn't. There was just so much to learn. Um, it helped that I won NCAs that same year that I went professional, so I got a lot of opportunities and that kind of springboard me to have the kind of career that I wanted to have and that, you know, that kind of, I think, kind of put Diane on the map in a different way. Um, but it was, it was hard, you know, there were a lot of Olympics and World Championships where I was the only person there, so that was kind of tough and it was something to get used to, but I think on the upside of it, we have so many more athletes coming up that are way more talented than I was, um, that have figured out things that it took me years to figure out. Um, so I'm happy about that, that we don't have to kind of reinvent the wheel and learn new things. We could just learn from my mistakes and move on. Um, so I, I, I think that's one of the biggest things in my career is that people don't have to kind of experience what I do. And how do you help your athletes that you coach, of course, at St. John's now, how do you help them transition as they're getting towards the end of their college careers um, to go potentially professional or even just to go into, you know, other jobs that they want to explore? Um, well, because I've been through it, I, I, I think one of the biggest things for me is like introducing them to people that have kind of gone one way or the other. You have really good athletes that decide not to go professionally. They take the academic war out or the work route and then you have athletes that do go professional so for me it's giving them the opportunity to using my network you know and having them talk to all three of those groups so that they're they're making the right decision and it's something that they're going to be able to live with for a couple of years and just two last questions um, of course this month in june we're coming up on 50 years of title nine um and so can you talk to me about some of your role models and maybe some women that you looked up to um, as you were coming into this sport, whether that be in track or even outside. Yeah. Of oh, absolutely. I mean, a, a lot of my role models have been in track. I think there's something really special about an athlete that's able to put things together on the field of play and then they kill it and crush it in the real world. So I, I like people that multitask like that. And so um, from Colombia, there's a quarter miler, Simena Restrepo, and she's now um, an executive member of World Athletics. And we're both South Americans. She's phenomenal. I'm aiming to be phenomenal. So I've, I've always kind of looked up to her because regionally we didn't have a lot of people. In the US, you have unlimited amount of people. Jamaica, even with track and field, they have a rich history. But to have someone from South America like me just killing it big time, it was her. And then at the collegiate level, um, Amira Bello, I, I don't know if you know her, but she went to Morgan State. And same thing, just a phenomenal athlete, incredible student, and just a model 
citizen in life and so those were two of my my biggest women's um, inspiration and then for us because St. John's is only a, a women's uh, program now they no longer have a men's program so we're we're kind of our program is is a um, direct beneficiary I guess of Title IX um, so that that's special in a way you know I, I love the sport so I'm a little bit torn that you know half of it is missing but for our girls to have the opportunities that they have um, and achieve the things that they have I feel like it's really incredible. Nice, I love that. And so last question, so you did the mainly the 400 right? Mm -hmm. Well you competed in a plethora of different events. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. in an alternate universe if you can compete in any event in track what would you do? Um, I feel like I would have been good at the eight. I actually ran 203 in the eight and then I stopped. No one knows that. I ran the eight like three times, ran 203, and I was like, I don't like where this is going. I didn't want to train for the eight. I didn't want to do the distance, you know. I wanted to be a sprinter because it's so glamorous. I would get all the attention. I, I get the butt, the 800. I, I didn't see it. Um, but I think if I had it to do over again, I would take the eight seriously. Oh my God, you're in 203 yeah. and then I know. you stopped. And then I stopped. I ran, I, I think 212, 210, two, what, four times, 207, and then 203. And I was like, the end. <laughs> oh my gosh, you could have been killing me today, but <laughs> you know, alternate universe, talking about things. If we, you know, if we could do it over, will we do? it would probably be that because it, it, it came kind of easy i didn't train for it i was injured yeah. and my coach was like you can't sprint but you need fitness i was like i'll just jog some eight and every time i did it i got better and i was like i just i just can't see myself doing five mile repeats and whatever other crazy stuff 800 meter runners do um and like i said i thought the sprints were glamorous and that's what i wanted to there you go. Well, amazing career regardless, and you are that. making such a huge impact, of course, at St. John's here in New York City, but for Guyana as well, and the Caribbean and South America. So thank you so much, and great to talk with you.